Uh, please welcome Kyla Allison and her talk, Marine Protected Areas, Conserving the Waters of the Iconic Lost Coast. Thanks for joining us, Kyla and Jamie, and please tell us a little bit more about yourself, Kyla, your work, and the MPA Collaborative Network before you get started. Take it away. Sure. Thanks for um, having us. I'm really excited to be presenting to this group. Any chance I can get to talk about the Lost Coast, I actually had the pleasure of hiking it twice. Um, for work uh, to take pictures of marine protected areas um, and to document the boundaries and had a great experience. Uh, we ended up losing the pictures from the first time we did it uh, and so we had to redo it and hike it again and maybe it was just meant to be because the second time was even more amazing than the first. So I'm really happy to be here to talk about uh, the marine protected areas along the Lost Coast. Um, and feel free to, you know, put yourselves on camera. This is a small group, so we can make it um, informal. I know it's being recorded for future views as well, but um, we can just kind of have a chat. A uh, little bit about myself first before we get started. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network. I was also a stakeholder um, on the Marine Life Protection Act initiative that set up the marine protected areas on the South Coast. Um, I was selected because I was the marine protection officer for the city of Laguna Beach and a part of this Orange County collaborative that brought together all the stakeholders and city, county, state, and federal agencies around the local management of Orange County's marine protected areas because they're being loved to death. Basically, everyone wanted to go to the tide pools. They all wanted to take a shell home. They all wanted to, you know, hold hermit crabs in their hands. Um, and they were being loved to death. So we got this group together to figure out how we could streamline our actions and be on the same page and have consistent messaging. Um, and it ended up being this, this great collaboration where we got to leverage each other's resources. We knew we were being consistent. We could share lessons learned. We had joint trainings with each other. Um, and so we had this collaborative group that really worked in managing the marine protected areas there. Um, and so after being a part of the stakeholder process and being connected to fish and wildlife, um, there is this idea that we should probably do this in the other counties. Um, and it took a while to, to convince Fish and Wildlife and the Ocean Protection Council to support this crazy idea of getting people together for more of a grassroots level management. Um, but that's how the collaborative network was born. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that as well later before um, we jump into the specific Lost Coast MPAs. Um, but I'm from Santa Cruz. I started out as an ocean lifeguard before I got into ocean conservation. Um, I have a master's in Pacific International Affairs, so really looked at international environmental policy as well. And I kept coming to the same conclusion that if you don't have local support and local buy-in, you can pass as many international accords and laws as you want, but they're going to be paper parks unless you really have that local buy-in and sense of stewardship. So that's why we're here connecting with you all. Um, and Jamie, I don't know if you wanna take a moment to just introduce yourself as well as our North Coast Specialist. Yeah, thanks Kella and hi everyone. So I am our North Coast Specialist. So Kella will get into the whole structure, but. Essentially, we have a group in each of the 14 coastal counties, and a lot of my role is supporting our collaboratives in Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte counties. And so I personally am live in Humboldt County in McKinleyville. I have been down to the Lost Coast a number of times um, and love all of the wonderful communities in that area um, and yeah, I love when I have the opportunities to get out there. And uh, in addition to supporting those collaboratives, uh, I also bring a climate change lens to my work uh, as well as um, justice and equity. I do uh, a lot of relationship building and support with our indigenous partners um, in the region and statewide. So glad to be here. Thanks, Jamie. 
And I think just to get us started, I have a short video that talks about the Network of Marine Protected Areas and our organization. So I'm going to start with that. And we are going to hope that all the tech works. And hopefully, Jamie, can you see my screen? OK, let me give it a sh text that out and give it a shot here. No sound, Kella. We tested it earlier and there was sound, but you're not hearing anything? <laughs> Justin, Justin, I thought we heard it before. <laughs> yeah, let me try one more time. Nothing. I think maybe you should stop sharing and then when you click share, you might have the option of like also share sound. Because if you're hearing me, you should be able to hear the sound because it's very loud. No. <laughs> okay, I'll try one more time and then we might have to give up and then I'll be sad. Or we can show it at the end once we figure it out. One more time. Okay, we're seeing a screen. And no one else can hear it either behind me. Can you hear me, Jamie? Yes. <laughs> That's so yeah, I, funny. Can't, I can't hear it either. Okay. I think one of the biggest accomplishments. Very oh. Just right at the end, it started. A sound snippet came through. Yeah, because it's really loud in here. So <laughs> that's funny, maybe, but that's right when I stopped uh, sharing my screen. Well, okay. Maybe we'll. Hello, one more thing I'll have you try. So okay. when you click share screen, and then it gives you the options of what to share. In yes. the bottom left, there's that little box that says share sound. Got it. Try that. Thanks, everyone. I said to ask the tech gods to be on my side. So, <laughs> okay, share sound. The We're tech gonna... gods don't take sides, Kella. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try one more time. Oh, no, wait, that's not gonna be good. Last time. One of the biggest accomplishments of the collaborative network and something we really value is bringing together people that might not have come together otherwise to think about the best way to manage marine protected areas. Bringing the tribes together with agency and enforcement officers, with environmental nonprofits, bringing them together with the fishermen and bringing the scientists too that can share their perspective. Having all those people at the table and having them feel like their voices are heard and that their voices are valued, you know, that is a huge asset that really can't be replicated anywhere else. It needs to be channeled and, and harnessed and leveraged in a way that can really help fish and wildlife do the best job they can. I think we all are very, very concerned about the ocean condition. I mean, this is our livelihood. This is what we do for a living. And we certainly do not want to see any damage done to the ocean in any way. There's a way to work around this stuff. Everybody needs a little bit, you know, we need to give and take. 
One of the problems we have historically with resource management is that people tend to work in their own little silo. The scientists work on the research and monitoring, enforcement officers just do enforcement, the nonprofits are working on the conservation side, and the fishermen are making a living. And I think it's really important connecting them to the managing agency so they're not all on their own doing separate, disparate things, but they're coming together with the managing agency, doing something that's approved, that can actually be supportive. So there's this top-down, bottom-up where we come together and make very valuable products, we make valuable relationships, and we're actually able to leverage not just the natural resources, but the social resources and the value they bring to the table as well. We want to make sure that they're not paper parks, of course. We want to manage them for the long term. And part of that effort is making sure that we really start enabling communities to become stewards of their MPAs and hopefully that spreads beyond the coast and becomes a part of, of who we are, our coastal stewards. All right, we got it to work. <laughs> Started with a nice little video with lots of pretty pictures and hopefully gave you guys kind of an overview um, of where we're coming from, which is definitely more aligned with the community approach um, and organizations like yours. Now I'm gonna switch to sharing screen to my PowerPoint here. Are we good with that? Awesome. Okay, so as the video started with, oh goodness, almost showed you again. Um, California established a network and it's actually the world's largest MPA network as far as how many marine protected areas it has connected. This was fully established in 2012. Um, and this was a big move, and I just, I guess I want to call out that this is in the law. It was passed in 1999 that we needed to have a network of marine protected areas. Um, and so the, the people of California, they voted, they decided we needed this, um, and it took a, over 10 years to actually come up with this network of marine protected areas. There were a bunch of false starts. Um, one is they just tried to, you know, kind of politically designate them and there was a lot of pushback. Um, and then they said, well, let's base, let's go to the scientists and see where they think they should be. There was also pushback because it didn't involve stakeholders. Um, and so finally the third real attempt was, okay, what we need to do is have um, some science guidelines. It has to be run by kind of a state agency um, with support, with philanthropy, of course, um, and it needs to be guided by stakeholders. We need the input of commercial and recreational fishermen. We need the input of the different levels of agencies and then conservationists um, and recreationists as well. Uh, and so they broke it into the different study regions. They got these stakeholders together. And basically we had the science in front of us and they said, now go figure out where these marine protected areas should go um, and what the regulations should be. So it was, it was a lot of sausage making, um, a lot of compromise, a lot of debate. Um, but we made great ground as far as increasing the level of protection. We went from just having, you know, 2.7% of state waters to 16% of state waters, which is a big jump. Um, and 9% of that is no take. 
Um, so on the flip side of that, for a lot of our fishing um, partners and friends, uh, that means that, you know, you still have 91% where some type of fishing intake is allowed for, for state waters. And you can see that statewide map, a lot of little colored areas that show um, the 124 plus marine protected areas that we ended up with. So the Marine Life Protection Act had goals and these we were told very clearly what these goals were and this will continue um, to be the main goals for as long as we have the Marine Protected Area Network. Um, and one is, you know, a big one. We need to protect the biodiversity of our coastal waters. Um, that's huge. We need to work on rebuilding populations. We don't want to make it so we can't ever fish these species again. We want to make sure they can rebound and they're sustainable. Um, we also want there to be research, education, and recreational opportunities. We don't want to close any areas off if we can help it. Um, we want to make sure we're researching it, um, that people have an opportunity to also recreate there as well. Um, protecting marine heritage is huge. We're working with a lot of our tribal partners up and down um, the state. And in also looking, you know, there's archaeological sites, there's also shipwrecks that are part of marine heritage or long-term protected areas that are part of marine heritage. Um, and then they need to be managed, they need to be enforced, and there needs to be sound science um, that's backing up these protected areas. So this is kind of a clear um, point that these need to be adaptively managed. We need to monitor them, and if they're not working, we need to reassess because you, we have to hit the other goals of protecting biodiversity and rebuilding populations. Uh, and it needs to be, and it, it has to function as a network. There needs to be an ecologically connected network. So it makes sense that it's hitting a whole bunch of habitat types and it's working, not just one little place is working and the rest aren't. The entire coastline of California is robust and healthy. That's the goal. So I'm just gonna give like a really just high level overview of the science because I am a social scientist. I am not a marine biologist, um, but I'm all about messaging the science. And some of the bigger takeaways of what marine protected areas do is they protect bigger, older fish. Um, and we even have these great pillows, fish pillows, or we call them boffs, big, old, fat, fertile female fish pillows. Uh, that we take to um, classrooms and outreach events that show if it's a small fish, you're only going to make so many babies. Medium fish, you know, you're starting to, to make more. Um, you let a fish like this one, the vermilion rockfish, grow to 23 inches and they are going to make 1.7 million of babies. Um, that are then going to populate the area. It can spill out outside the marine protected area um, and then they can go on and you have that exponential um, increase. And this just kind of makes sense to people. I've let them grow to a bigger size. They're going to make more fish and that's going to be um, a healthier e ecosystem all the way around. The second main point when we're talking about the science of MPAs is that it needs to be functioning in a network. Um, and this was a part of our science guidelines we had in designating them is that, you know, they had to be a certain distance apart. So you had this benefit where instead of just the small green circle where, you know, those um, all the babies from those big old fertile female fish just go into this one little area. If you have smaller MPAs that are spaced strategically apart, then you end up bathing the entire coastline and you end up just having more impact um, for that larval dispersal. So that is why we ended up having you know, this huge network across the entire state. It goes from the Oregon border all the way down to the Mexico border. And actually we have two MPAs that are on the border. They go to the line, that's their boundary. So we're really taking that border to border quite seriously. 
And also we're making sure that the connectivity is representative of a lot of different habitats. Um, so, you know, if you would have asked Orange County, for example, back then, they were really concerned about the intertidal habitat. So they wanted that protected. But there also was so many other habitats that need to be represented and protected as well. There needed to be sandy bottom. Um, there needed to be uh, rocky shores or submarine, like really deep water fish need to be protected as well. Um, there's all of these different habitats and they all have equal value. They're all connected and they all need to have some type of protection um, represented as a part of this network. So that's kind of the reason behind establishing the 124 marine protected areas. Um, and that was great. That's our goal. But then the state was suddenly faced with how are we going to do this? This is a huge task to be able to scientifically monitor all these areas, make sure there's adequate enforcement, make sure people even know about the marine protected areas. Like, how are we going to do this for the entire state when we're one fairly small agency? Um, and the answer was they couldn't, right? They definitely needed the help um, of partners and diverse partners. And that's where we came in. Um, so I kind of told you at the, at the very beginning that we had a this great collaborative group established in Orange County. Um, and you know, I didn't see any reason why we couldn't do that for every coastal county. And there was skepticism at first, especially since the designation process was kind of, there was a lot of contention. There was, um, you know, we were kind of debating each other where these marine protected areas were going to go. There was some hard feelings. Um, people felt left out that their voices weren't heard or they didn't get what they wanted, whether it was a big enough MPA or small enough MPA or no MPA at all. Um, so there was you know, some skepticism that we were gonna be able to bring all these different groups together. Um, but as it turned out, you know, people really wanted to make sure that this network was functional and that it was successful um, and that it was done correctly. So it definitely wasn't as hard as I initially thought to get the stakeholders and tribes and interested community members together um, to really make sure um, that these worked. So it took about uh, probably two years total to set up the 14 um, MPA collaboratives um, and now we have 1,400 members and we're representing over 450 distinct organizations and affiliations. So it really grew. There was an appetite for being involved in local level management rather than just hearing about it. Um, and, you know, kind of one of the, the benefits of, of this network too is it is diverse. There's engagement across many different sectors. Um, so we're bringing the scientists together with NGOs and tribal reps and government and ocean businesses and the fishermen. Um, and because of that, because of the diversity, because of all the resources everybody brings, that's an amazing contribution to fish and wildlife for the management. I mean, it's valued um, at $20 million because they did a study of just one, it came at $3.5 million in in-kind um, value to support marine protected area management. So even a low estimate, we're looking at $20 million statewide that we're assisting fish and wildlife with. So, and I made one circle just around Humboldt's collaborative, um, as we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but the collaboratives primarily assist with the priority projects um, in three management areas. So education and outreach, this is really where we first focused is how are people going to know about these marine protected areas? Let's make sure they know. Um, we also do some work in research and monitoring, mostly around community and citizen science, but we help a lot with the messaging of the science as well. And that's where Jamie comes in, you know, communicating um, a lot of 
the reasons why climate change and MPAs are also aligned and being able to distill that down in ways that people like me can understand. Um, and then enforcement and compliance. There are not very many fish and wildlife officers out there. There are really not a lot of wardens. Um, but there's a lot of other allied agencies and other officers out there. We have BLM rangers that are on the Lost Coast, for example. We have state parks, county sheriffs, NOAA officers, National Park Service. Uh, and so what we do is we help train all those officers in marine protected area regulations and boundaries so they can assist fish and wildlife. Um, with enforcing the marine protected area regulations. Now we've just expanded our impact on making sure that there's compliance. And then we know whether the MPAs work. So that's kind of how we're digging into supporting the management. Um, and so I did make the circle around the, the Humboldt Collaborative um, because you do want to make the point that you, we have this great network, 14 collaboratives and we share, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but there's a lot of membership just in this one collaborative in Humboldt. Um, and there's a lot of great participation and interest. And there's been a ton of projects already um, in the past eight years with the Humboldt MPA Collaborative. They have put together MB MPA Educator Toolkit. They did um, a curriculum, actually, that was NGSS. Um, you know, approved, and they did a lot of fun projects like the Kids Ocean Day, they have many ROVs, um, just a lot of great things to get the word out uh, about marine protected areas um, to the Humboldt County community uh, and beyond. And so, well, actually, let me go back here because then I circle kind of what you guys are interested in here are the Lost Coast MPAs. Um, so if you dive down even further from the county level, each MPA or cluster of MPA also has a group of local experts and interested um, people. So they can benefit from the larger collaborative and Humble and Del Norte that then benefits from the network of collaboratives. So it's just kind of this exponential impact of partnerships. Um, and I think that's, I really want to make that point because I think that's a vital, um, you know, reason for our success is that we're able to just scale up and then scale it back down, figure out what may work in one area and how to adapt it to Humboldt and then specifically how to adapt it to the Lost Coast. Um, because it's not cookie cutter, right? But there's so many different nuance and culture and differences and accessibility um, terrain uh, as you go up and down the coast of California, even within you know one particular county. So before I kind of get into to this, 2020, we asked people okay, what are your concerns in Humboldt County around the coast? You know, we can talk about marine protected areas, but what else are you seeing like between the marine protected areas? What are your um, concerns? Uh, what are some of the things that you think um, are making it that people are breaking the MPA regulations? They're not complying. Um, what are the issues? And uh, we actually got a really good turnout for, for this forum from community members. And um, they had some concern, the concerns focused on the Lost Coast were that people were harvesting mussels and, um, and fishing and also leaving a lot or having debris washed up and leaving debris on the Lost Coast. Um, so that was a specific concern for this area. And you know, a main factor across the county that they cited was that there's still just a lack of awareness. And, and I think maybe you guys can vouch for that. You know, you might not have it like, maybe you've heard of marine protected areas. I'd love to pull you guys, but it's, I know you're all muted. Um, but there's still, even with, you know, ocean goers and coastal, um, you know, people that live along the coast, there's still just not a huge awareness of marine protected areas um, and what the regulations are and where they are. So that's a big factor. There's also a shortage of uniform personnel or enforcement officers or people to tell you where they are. You know, hey, just so you know, 
you know, I'm your friendly ranger and you're in a marine protected area and you can't fish here, you have to go further down. Um, it's hard if you don't have that type of involvement to help people do the right thing. So based on these results, the Humboldt Collaborative teamed up with the Delnort Collaborative um, and came up with a couple of projects to address these compliance concerns. And I do want to pass this over to Jamie to talk about because as a North Coast specialist, she really spearheaded the development and outreach to community members for input and partners um, to put these projects together. So I do want to give you a second to just talk about these projects because it's definitely something that is going, I think is already in your community now, right? We dropped off some brochures. Yes, actually, just this week, um, one of our partners at the um, Atoll Restoration Council distributed these brochures um, to various locations um, in Petrolia and Honeydew. And so um, I can actually, after this, I can put those locations in the chat in case you wanted to go um, and pick up one of these brochures. And they highlight um, where all of the marine protected areas are, as well as the regulations and there's some ecology and also information about um, indigenous peoples and their connection to the regional marine protected areas. Uh, we also uh, are putting in new regulatory and interpretive sign. Uh, we're currently working with BLM, um, Atoll Restoration Council, the King Range Alliance, uh, and local tribes to get uh, interpretive signs at either end of the Lost Coast Trail to educate hikers about marine protected areas. Um, there's also going to be now on the Lost Coast Trail maps, um, there's going to be um, indication of what is and is not allowed in the marine protected areas so that hikers um, can see those regulations. It will also, um, it shows the boundaries now on those maps, but the boundaries are going to get um, more prominent so that hikers can really see. And then um, one other thing we did is um, supported our indigenous partners in creating this document that has uh, really the best practices for how to engage indigenous peoples equitably in marine protected area stewardship with the acknowledgement that, um, you know, all protected lands are on indigenous lands and there was contention when marine protected areas were enacted. And so with all of this in mind, um, historical and ongoing injustice, how can those working in marine protected areas um, do the most equitable engagement um, to uplift our indigenous partners. So those are just a few of the projects that have been taking place uh, in the region this year. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. And we're really excited about these projects. Oops, let me make sure. Um, so these projects were an education outreach. This is, you know, this great brochure um, makes it's a little bit different than what we've seen in other counties because the whole big part of the inside panel is information um, about local tribes. And that was one of the priorities from the compliance and from the collaborative that they really wanted to highlight those voices. So that is something that we're taking back to the other collaboratives to share. Um, on the flip side of that, we also get to benefit from what they're doing. Um, so, you know, sign templates that we can, you know, model ours after for, you know, the trailheads, for example. Um, you know, this coloring book, we have a bilingual coloring book that has um, a virtual reality page. So you color it, you scan it that using quiver, and then you can play video games with the fish you just colored and like make it eat like fish and become a boff. Amazing. Like a whole bunch of really cool projects that then we get to um, share across the entire collaborative and a lot of lessons learned just down the road. Mendocino and Sonoma, they traveled, you know, those Caltrans digital signs. They said, you know, for really high impact areas in summer months, it would be great if we had those, um, you know, at access points as people are driving into parking lots that say, hey, respect wildlife or marine protected areas, know the regulations or leash your dogs. Um, and so that was something that was piloted as well in other parts of the state that we're able to benefit and learn from. 
Now that's kind of all the different things we're doing. Lots of MPA videos. There is a great um, video for both Del Norte and Humboldt that talks about marine protected areas. If you guys are ever doing outreach and would like to use those videos, Jamie, maybe you can put in the chat um, the resource libra library that specifically has all the Humboldt resources that are for you guys to use. It's for everybody. The idea is to really spread the word. So research and monitoring is the same thing. I saw somebody said, what's an ROV? Awesome, I love it. Um, so we actually have the mini version. So mini remote operated vehicles, we call them underwater drones or underwater robots too. Um, they're tethered and you can use them to go underwater and take video. Um, and there's been some great discoveries made. They actually got on video um, a sturgeon out at Smith River, which is the first documented case of that. And I don't know how many ever, I think, Jamie, right? Um, or at least a very long time. And, um, you know, people are also using them for educational tools, having kids drive them, um, or even there's the ability to live stream into the classroom what you're seeing underwater. And this is especially good tool maybe for the North Coast where people might not be as excited to get in the water themselves, um, but still would like to see what's underwater. Uh, this is a tool that they can use and anybody can use it as being a part of the collaborative. Uh, we also have this snapshot Cal Coast, which you go out, you take a picture with your phone, um, you upload it to iNaturalist, and it populates this statewide data set of what's happening in our, in our tidal areas. And I happen to be hiking the Lost Coast during snapshot Cal Coast and was able to document a lot of the species in the marine protected areas there, uh, mostly big flat. Um, that got to populate this, this statewide um, snapshot in time of our inner title. Um, and then we help connect community science programs to local communities too, like MPA Watch. Uh, this is something that would be great uh, to have along the Lost Coast or um, at Matol or you know, with the Petrolia community um, to say, what are you seeing out there? and being able to kind of mark human uses. Um, you know, I see lots of people with their dogs or I see lots of people um, collecting shells, whatever whatever you're seeing. Uh, so that's how the, the ways we encourage um, participation. But once again, it's kind of the exponential. So even though it will tell you exactly what you're seeing at Big Flat, it's also populating the statewide snapshot of what's happening across the entire coast. So this is why that network and um, community engagement across the 14 collaboratives is important. And then enforcement and compliance. I already talked about how just, you know, having more people trained, the kind of our, our major priority was um, making it so there wasn't somebody in a uniform um, that, didn't say anything to somebody that was breaking the law because they didn't know they were breaking the law. So you have two people that might not know, um, you know, at least we would like that officer to know and be able to say, hey, just so, just so you're aware, um, we always encourage education first um, in any type of enforcement action, uh, but there, there also is a great need um, for Fish and Wildlife to have the support of allied agencies um, and just ensuring that people are following the rules. Um, you know, poaching MPAs is still a big concern. I think it's going to continue to be as concerned as the MPAs are more successful. As they make more and bigger fish, there's going to be some interest in, in going and getting that. Um, and we especially see this with abalone too, now that abalone is closed. Uh, there's definitely interest um, in taking that. So we want to make sure there's eyes on the water. Um, and that if there are egregious violations, there are some repercussions. So we bring all the different agencies together and work on that as well. And what all this means is that um, we're offsetting all these statewide costs and it's leading to more effective management. It just makes sense. Like you guys are going to know your area 
better than somebody working in a cubicle in Sacramento, of course. But how do we elevate your voices? How do we make sure that expertise is acknowledged and heard and then implemented? Um, and so this is the structure we have. And now we have an MOU with the state that recognizes that and says, yes, we would like the input of our local partners, um, which is amazing because this is a new model. It's a little bit different, you know, having it be grassroots and bottom up is, you know, kind of not the norm for state agencies that are more top down. And what we do as a collaborative network is we meet in the middle and we try to help facilitate that communication both up and down and then across the network. Okay, so that was just the overview. Now we're going to get into the Lost Coast Marine Protected Areas. And I'm just going to go um, north to south. And I'm just quickly um, just checking chat to make sure I'm not missing any questions as we go. Um, but sorry, now I got to hit the key again. Um, so I did highlight, you know, our, our Lost Coast MPAs, but in general, across the county, there's four different MPA types and to 10 total MPAs in Humboldt County. Um, and I'm just going to go quick overview. If it's in red, if you ever see a map, you finally get, um, you know, Jamie in the Humboldt's beautiful brochure. Um, if it's in red, that means it's a no-take state marine reserve. Easy to remember, right? It's red, which means stop sign. Do not. Uh, and the do not is really strict. Like no take means attempt to take um, possession. So even if you pick something up to look at it more closely, uh, that's considered take. That's why you can't do catch and release because you're attempting to take, you're possessing it, it counts as take. So it's really a, quite a strict definition. Um, then we have state marine conservation areas. They allow some type of recreational and commercial take. The problem with these, it's not, real, well, it is a little bit of a problem. A lot of these SMCAs have different regulations. So they're not consistent. So you really need to know the specific regulations for that state marine conservation area. So that just kind of um, increases the, the level of education and outreach that you need to do for, for the SMCAs. Uh, we also have state marine recreational management areas. We call them shmermas affectionately, just because that's fun to say. So that's in South Humboldt Bay. Uh, and then special closures. And these are actually not considered marine protected areas because marine protected areas allow access. So in special closures specifically, restrict access to protect um, haul out sites and uh, seabird rookeries. And we got two of those on the Lost Coast, or at least the stretch leading up to the Lost Coast adjacent. We're kind of having a debate of like where we start counting the Lost Coast. So you guys can educate us on that as well. I'm just gonna go um, north to south here. So Sugarloaf Island Special Closure, um, and that is not allowing any type of access um, 300 feet seaward of the mean lower low tide um, of any shoreline of Sh Sugarloaf Island. So it's a nice little circle, 300 feet circle around Sugarloaf. Those are some of the boundaries. I know I need to go a little bit quicker. South Cape Mendocino is our first very substantial state marine reserve that does not allow any take. Um, and you can see it's kind of right just south of Sugarloaf Island and then goes out to Steamboat Rock. Steamboat Rock is kind of the same thing. They, it has a circle around that restricting access. The difference is it's just during the period of March 1st to August 31st. So if you're not in that period, you can actually access um, the special closure. Some pictures from our wonderful um, licensed land surveyor that knows where exactly they are. Matol Canyon State Marine Reserve, also a no-take area. This one's interesting because it actually does not go to the all the way to the coastline. It's just kind of out in the water um, off the Matol River.
And then Sea Lion Gulch State Marine Reserve is the um, SMR that's on the Lost Coast Trail. It does not allow any take approximately, you know, one mile south of the Punta Gorda Lighthouse all the way down to the southern boundary, which is about, um, it's actually, yeah, a half mile north of Kuski Creek, actually. That says south, but it's north. So that whole check section is no take. And then the last Lost Coast Trail MPA is Big Flat State Marine Conservation Area. So this does, the way they do the code is it tells you what you can do. You can't do anything except for, and the things that are the except for are recreational take of salmon by trolling and crab by trap, hoop net, or hand. Um, and also the commercial take of those things as well. So something to, to call out here and which will be interesting also for um, your next speaker next week is that there are federally recognized tribes that are exempt from these MPA regulations. Um, and for this particular area, it's a fairly long list. These are all tribes that have historical harvesting and gathering um, rights to this area and are maintaining them. Um, you know, through these exemptions. So they still have to have a fishing license and follow other fishing game codes, but they do not have to follow um, the marine protected area codes. And these are the boundaries it goes from Big Creek to just south of Big Flat Creek. And there seems, this is a great in our title section. So I did see that there's um, maybe some intertidal take going along this MPA, which would be against the regulations. And I know we're almost at the end of our time. So I guess I kind of wanted to ask you guys, you know, as the experts, um, you know, friends of the Lost Coast, I don't know what your questions were, what your priorities are for the future um, for protecting this whole area. I mean, as I stated before, it's meant to act as you know, a network. So it's not just those areas that are in the boxes, but all the areas in between that they're also stabilizing. Um, you know, we want the ocean to be healthy, of course, uh, along the entire stretch. Um, so I guess with that, we can um, open it up to questions. And, and also you're all welcome to join the collaborative. It doesn't, none of this is gonna work without participation um, from our local experts and community members. So Justin, if you want to allow people to ask questions. Yep, so uh, I will turn on everybody's, uh, give them the ability to unmute themselves. And uh, ask some questions here. All right, so everybody is now has the ability to unmute, I believe. So if you decide to do that, uh, please do so and uh, or otherwise use the chat feature to put your questions in there. Um, I had a couple questions, I guess, to get started. Um, I was wondering about the state marine reserves and uh, why those areas specifically were designated as no take and what was going on there that sort of, uh, you know, prioritized them for a higher level of protection. Yeah, that's a good question. And I wasn't a part of um, the North Coast des designation process, but in general, um, according to the science guidelines, there needed to be a certain amount of reserves um, to make sure that we had the level of protection across the state. And you know, a lot of the negotiation that went into it was um, putting it in a place that would be represent a certain habitat type and be big enough to actually protect that habitat, but have a minimal impact on commercial and recreational fishing. So it would have less of an economic impact. So they were kind of put in areas that might be a little bit further away um, from harbors and marinas. Um, so you could fish closer and not spend as much money on gas. So a lot of those things were taken into account. Um, and also this is my favorite fishing place. Like, if there's another place that would work, don't put it here. A lot of that would, went into the discussion as well. Um, I will say that the North Coast was the only study region that they came to, everyone came to a compromise. 
It didn't have to be, you know, somebody pick one or the other. Um, they, all the stakeholders came to, um, you know, a compromise on where they wanted the marine protected areas to be and what levels of protection. Gotcha. And are tribes also excluded from those no-take zones or are they able to do traditional fishing? Yeah, the tribal, great question. Tribal exemptions only apply to state marine conservation areas. The no-take are just strictly no-take um, and there are no exemptions because the, the blue ones allow some type of something. So it just makes sense that, you know, if you see somebody um, fishing there, if they're fishing for the right thing or doing it the right way or tribal, um, that makes sense where it's much easier to be like, it's across the board, no take for these areas. And there needed to be that level of protection. Gotcha. And with the Matola Canyon um, conservation area, is it odd that that doesn't go to the coastline? And is there a reason why that one wouldn't go all the way to the shore? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I kind of want to go back to some of the rationale. And I don't know if any of you know that were around during the designation process. I would I think it would have something to do with the mouth of the Matol River um, and leaving that open for fishing, maybe. Um, or maybe there's interest in shore-based fishing, you know, from Petrolia or from local areas. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So do you uh, see that with other river systems at the mouth of other river, river systems that are in MPA kind of areas? You know, it's either been on one side or the other. I haven't seen too many that make that interesting little shape. <laughs> so I yeah. question, I guess, before we see if anybody else uh, wants to chime in here, but you asked about, you know, our vision for the Lost Coast. And I guess I wonder um, in terms of you know, expansion of the NPA system, is that something that uh, we've been seeing additions to the system since 2013 or, uh, or, uh, or not? And if so, um, is there sort of a vision for, you know, long-term, uh, you know, how, what percentage of state waters or, or maybe even specifically on the Lost Coast, I guess, additions to the, the NPA network here locally? Yeah, great question. I'm realizing I needed to have a slide in the presentation for this and I did not. Uh, there is a decadal management review. It's been 10 years. So what they're doing is they have all the science from 10 years and they will be presenting the results of what's happened after 10 years of a network of marine protected areas. Um, and so before we think about anything as far as what we're going to do in the future, um, the Fish and Game Commission is going to receive those results and we're all going to receive those results. Are they working? And a lot of the science is actually out. And I don't know, Jamie, if you can kind of put that link um, to the USC grant reports um, in the chat, but a lot of that science is out, but we're just at the point of like evaluating the first 10 years and thinking about what we can do better. And that's why I kind of ask, what are your priorities? What do you want to see in the future? Um, but we have to get to that first 10 years and then can we make small tweaks? Um, I think they're thinking small tweaks at this point, not get rid of MPAs or add MPAs. I think they're trying to figure out how to make this network work. Uh, 2023 is, is the 10 year, is the next 10 year sort of threshold. Say that again. 2023 is the next 10 year threshold if it was. Yeah, this is the first one. And well, it was supposed to be 22, but it, that, it took them a whole year to put the report together. So uh, March 15th is going to be the report out. They're having an MPA day for the Decadal Management Review. Um, that's going to be in Monterey, and they're going to report out. They really want to wait till they're done with that before they start thinking about 30 by 30. I think that's what you were hinting at. You know, are there, are we thinking about some protections of 30% of our um, land and waters by 2030? I think they wanted to look at this MPA network um, before they started digging into this broader um, question of, of 30 by 30. Gotcha. So it looks like we've got a couple other questions in the chat, some of which have uh, been answered by Jamie. But um, one question is, are there specific species being protected in these areas or is it all marine life? Yeah, that's a great question. This is really intended um, to be ecosystem based. Um, instead of kind of a lot of the, the regulations before were to protect like single species. Um, and this was like, let's set aside whole areas and let it regulate itself. 
um, instead of trying to do kind of some of the guesswork. So that that was the idea is that it's is, this is ecosystem based protection rather than species. Um, but with that said, there are species that are more likely to benefit and there's a whole list of them. Um, you know, it's the ones that are kind of more slow moving. Uh, there's some species that are going to benefit from those protections greatly. And then we're, we're definitely seeing that, you know, in the South Coast with a huge boom of lobster, for example, they really just kind of um, took off. So they're one of those species that was likely to benefit. Great. So any other questions folks have, please either put them in the chat or you're welcome to turn on your camera and unmute yourself and, and uh, join us here. Uh, in more of a personal kind of way, but uh, how everyone we're doing is fine. In the meantime, I have another question. I guess I was wondering in terms of the larger interconnectedness of uh, the coastline beyond California, um, how California's MPAs might, um, you know, uh, work in tandem with the marine protected areas further north of the California coastline or, or even south in international waters like in Mexico. Yeah, another good one. Um, we've had some joint conferences and meetings with Oregon. Uh, they have six marine protected areas, uh, so a smaller network. Um, they also have a community group um, that works with the, the one further south. Um, and then, you know, obviously we, we work with both Oregon and as much as we can with Mexico um, on those MPAs that are on the borders too, to like have that partnership. Um, but you know, it's, it's something we're looking, we are hoping to share our model, you know, with other States. Um, so it can expand beyond California, but we think, you know, there needs to be stakeholder engagement to make it work. So that's really the message, um, we're sharing and that it needs to be a network of marine protected areas as well. Um, so we try to, you know, talk as much as we can with, um, you know, definitely other West Coast states and then um, working with some East Coast states, hopefully in the in the future as well. And with these federal, uh, or I guess just different states waters, would you say California, based on the percentage of coastline or waters protected is, um, you know, more so, uh, obviously, at, you know, notwithstanding that we're a larger state than these other uh, states, but in terms of the percentage of protected waters, is California above average in that regard? Yes, for sure. We are a way ahead of the game. And I would even say internationally. Um, and you know, we're going to impact five, which is the International Marine Protected Area Conference. It's going to be in Vancouver. Um, and you know, there's some great MPA management out there, but a network this large covering the entire state, it's that's really not seen anywhere else, not to this extent or level. So yeah, California is definitely leading the way and a lot of states and countries are watching closely to see if it's successful um, and you know, seeing where the bumps are. And it seems like a success uh, so far, would that be your take? I, I think so, yeah. It's gonna be interesting to, to get the results. You know, it's, it's slow moving. So you're really not going to really see um, results for 20 years. It's just kind of the way how long it takes a vermilion rockfish to actually grow to become a big, fat, fertile female fish. You know, it takes a while. But um, I mean, I'm thinking just our level of engagement with the community and, um, you know, involvement and management. Uh, it's I think it's going to be successful and already is. Right. Well, I guess uh, any other, let's see, we got um, anyone else here? Uh, Ooh, that's a, thank you for sharing that we might have uh, malicious website stuff. Ooh, man, we have so much security going on on our website. <laughs> so one person is not gonna be excited about that, but thank you for flagging. Yeah, if you see anything else on our website that you can make corrections on, let us know and feel free to join. You can join whatever collaborative you want. You can just sign up for the newsletter just to stay informed. Um, but it's just a great way to you know participate in you know local stewardship. Um, you know, it's going to take all of us really moving forward to to make sure we have a, a healthy planet. So we really appreciate you guys even being here and listening.
um, yeah, and being involved. Those resources available to us, I definitely think that those are things that we can forward in our work and uh, use to educate people about marine protected areas. So that's great. And uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of those brochures, that looks like a beautiful brochure you all put together for Dornet, Del Norte, and Humboldt County. And if that's something you could help with disseminating around the Southern Humboldt area uh, beyond the spots you've already hit, we could certainly help with that and uh, get some copies at the BLM project office there in Whitethorn uh, as well. So great. That'd be amazing. Thank you. So I'll follow up with you all after that. But uh, I guess barring it doesn't seem like we got too many other questions. So um, I think we're at the point where uh, we would like to, on behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and BLM King Range National Conservation Area, Many thanks to Calla Allison and Jamie Blatter and the MPA Collaborative Network for this lecture. We hope you found it educational and inspiring. Visit lostcoast.org or our YouTube channel for a recording of the lecture, which will be posted in the coming days. And don't forget to join us this Sunday, November 13th, for our November garden celebration and native plant sale at the BLM Fire Complex in Whitethorn. And uh, then again on Thursday, November 17th from 6 to 7 p.m., for the third and final installment of this lecture series, Conserved Lands and Waters of the Lost Coast. Uh, that uh, edition will feature Priscilla Hunter and Hawk Rosales of the Intertribal Sinkiyun Wilderness Council and their presentation, Tribal Protected Areas of the Lost Coast. Thanks again for tuning in and to learn more about Friends of the Lost Coast or to make a donation to support our work, including programs like this lecture series, please visit our website at lostcoast.org. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and now TikTok. Enjoy the rest and the best from friends of the lost coast thanks everybody have a good night thanks